It's finally October, the month of pumpkin spiced everything, changing leaves, and of course, Halloween. The ghoulish holiday of October 31st is unlike any other. Americans carve jack-o'-lanterns, dress up as all things undead, and hang cotton spider webs in anticipation of the eager trick-or-treaters to come. While for some, Halloween is all about the candy and costumes, for others, it becomes a time to embrace the spooky and morbid sides of life and maybe even learn something new about death. Have you ever wondered what happens to a body post-mortem? Or what it's like to handle a skeleton? Or even what happens if you died in outer space? While thinking about skeletons and corpses is a seasonal theme for most people, it's just another day in the life for Caitlin Doty. Doty is a mortician and the author of the popular book, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? While her life's work may sound unsettling to many, Doty has always held a deep fascination with death and has long argued that it shouldn't be a taboo topic in this day and age. I personally was a pretty morbid child, and by the time I got to college, I decided to major in medieval history, where I studied death in the Middle Ages and actually the late medieval witchcraft trials. So I had this very academic interest in death. And I think when I started working at the crematory, I really thought that it was almost going to be sort of a summer job type thing. It was going to be something that I could look back and say, remember when I was a crematory operator when I was 22? But it really turned into, wow, this is my life. This is my passion. This is what I want to do. After college, Dodie brought this passion to her first job as a crematory operator. I was the one in the back actually cremating the dead bodies. And this was an eye-opening experience for me because I really didn't understand what went on behind the scenes in the American funeral industry. And once I knew, all I wanted to do was tell other people and share with other people because I think we have a real stigma and fear around death in the United States. And the only way to break through that is through conversation. Doty hopes to kickstart this conversation by sharing her own experience and what she's learned throughout her years of working in the funeral industry. I think for me, working in a crematory, the most surprising aspect of it was how often I was alone, how often I was just this 22-year-old girl who was alone cremating someone who had a rich history in life, and the family wasn't there alongside me. And that's usually because the family had no idea that they could be there. The family had no idea that they could come witness the cremation and roll the person into the cremation machine with me and start the process. And that kind of lack of family involvement is really new in human history. It's really only been the last 100 years in the modern industrialized West that we've cut people out, cut the family out of taking care of their own dead. In the U.S., what takes place after a person dies seems very detached to Doty. Some people turn down the opportunity to witness the cremation because they think in their head that it's going to be this very intense experience where maybe they're actually involved in the cremation or rigging out the hot bones. I'm not exactly sure what they think, but that's not the reality. It's actually a very simple ceremony where the door to the machine opens, the family can help push in the cremation container with the person that they loved inside it, and then someone can push the button, which starts the process of the cremation. And it's almost a ritual. It's a feeling like you're involved in the experience, and then everyone can leave in a thoughtful mood. If you are religious, you can chant or you can sing. You can really make it feel like a little ceremony there in the crematory. And it's something that I encourage, really encourage families to do. I have a great deal of respect for everyone that I cremated, but they weren't my family. I don't know them. I'm some random girl. And I think that you should be there with your family member until the very end. Dodie says it's important to recognize that this practice of being more detached from death is specific to the United States. Other countries and cultures handle death in different ways. When we think about what we do in the United States, most often, which is chemically preserve or embalm the body and put them in a big, heavy wood or metal casket, 
that's radically different than how other cultures view death or handle death. And they actually think that we're bonkers. We're crazy for handling death the way that we do. And in turn, we often look at other cultures that do things really differently and go, why do they do that? And I really push for a better cross-cultural understanding for people because every culture around the world wants to do right by their dead. Doty has traveled across the world researching and writing about how other cultures honor their dead through different traditions. I was in rural Indonesia in a place called South Sulawesi. And what they do is they not only keep the dead in their home for sometimes years after the death, but even after the person is finally buried, they will bring them out every couple of years. They will bring out their mummified body and redress them and clean the body and speak to them almost. It's a continuing relationship the way that we would have almost with prayer. They have it with the actual physical dead mummified body. And what was so interesting, I was there for this cleaning of the body ceremony, is that it feels so normal when you're there. It really doesn't feel like something macabre or something morbid or something Norman Batesy. It feels completely like this is a loving act that these families do for their dead. And it really puts into perspective how wrong we can be when we judge other cultures for doing death differently than we do. While some practices seem more shocking than others, there are seemingly endless variations of how to deal with death, with many more intimate than our own. In South Korea, cremation has become much more popular than casket burial. Many families then turn the ashes into colored beads to display in their home so that their loved ones are always close by. Travel to the Philippines, and some ethnic groups bury their loved ones inside trees that the deceased picks out before passing away. Doty says that Americans tend to sway away from being curious about their own death and what happens post-mortem. Yet we devour crime shows and podcasts that put death on display. To me, it's really seemed like true crime has emerged as a proxy for our death fears. It's a way to address our death fears, but almost coming at it sideways. So it's almost easier to read and get into someone's brutal murder, which is probably not going to happen to you, than it is to read about someone dying on hospice or someone having a heart attack, which is far more likely. So it's easier to read about a sensationalized death than it is a natural death. But Knowing we all face death someday, Doty says it's obvious that there's some internal intrigue out there about what really happens. I think a lot of people start out as children with a real morbid curiosity, and then adults tell them, no, that's wrong. Don't ask those questions. And by the time we grow up, we're not allowed to have these feelings and these thoughts and these fears. The number one thing I want to do is allow people to be curious about death. Death is interesting and fun. It's okay to be curious about it. It's okay to be fascinated by dead bodies. It's okay to be fascinated by the fact that we're walking around in these flesh sacks doomed to die. You don't have to just suppress that part of yourself and act like you don't have any questions or you don't have any fears, because we all do. And it's much easier to express those fears if we live in a culture where people feel safe asking questions. Dodie's unique role allows her to answer some of the creepy curiosities that people have kept to themselves. And she says most often, it's kids that come to her with the most surprising, no-filter questions. Can I keep my dad's skull after he dies? Can I give grandma a Viking funeral? What happens to an astronaut body if they die in space? Why do bugs eat people's flesh but not their bones? It's these types of questions that are so straightforward and so blunt, but so funny, that are so distinctly what a child would ask. So it's a way that an adult might phrase the question as more philosophy or spirituality, but a kid just goes straight in for the dead body question. The inspiration behind the title for Dodie's book, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs?, actually came from a curious young boy at an event in Australia who asked that very question. I was just so charmed immediately because it was so blunt. It was exactly what many adults are wondering, like, am I going to be an old cat woman whose cat eats my body? But it was done in this very specific 
funny way that is just perfectly emblematic of what I was trying to answer in the book. And for those who just have to know, will your cat actually eat you after you die? It'll take a while for your cats to eat you. They have to be pretty hungry. They would prefer their normal food, but they'll eventually get around to it if they're hungry enough. To find out more answers to some of the oddest death-related questions out there, check out Caitlin Doty's book, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? And visit viewpointsradio.org for more information. This segment was written and produced by Amira Zaveri and originally aired in October of 2019. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Coming up next week... The broccoli lobby isn't a very powerful political force, whereas the cattle lobby really is, and the sugar lobby really is. Rebalancing our food production efforts. Then... I think life should be enjoyed, and I think that there are pretty simple habits we can build into our lives that can make any given day feel better. The time management habits that stack up to make a big difference. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints.